Hello, everyone. Thanks, Alice. This series is being put on by the Upper Midwest Collaborative Plant Breeding Network. You see on the screen here logos from all of our different partners, uh, Organic Seed Alliance, University of Wisconsin, Seedlinked, eOrganic, Seed to Kitchen Collaborative out of Wisconsin, Nature and Nurture Seeds, and KC Tomato. It's Project is funded by the United States Department of Agriculture, the Organic Agriculture Research and Extension Initiative. And this is the sixth part of a six part series. Today, February 14th, Valentine's Day, feel free to drop some flowers or some hearts in the chat for us if you'd like. Uh, the first five presentations have already occurred and the recordings are available on, on the eOrganic YouTube channel. We covered everything from breeding project design to selecting breeding materials, producing high quality seed and seed diseases, releasing varieties and scaling up seed productions. Today we've uh, focused this presentation on some of the questions that we've been receiving throughout the series. And so we're gonna be talking a lot about data management and analysis. Um, and we also welcome any further questions that you have here today. So without, any more wait, I will pass the presentation over to Keith. Keith is going to start it for us. Thank you, Michael. Um, my name is Keith Mueller, and I live in Kansas City, Missouri. I guard, I farm both in Missouri and Kansas in the regional area here, and I have been working on breeding projects for over 30 years. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how I track my program and how I use some of the data that I generated. Um, it's different than when I first started out. When I first started out, I was working for a melon and bean breeder, and my job was to go out in two acres of melons and write down and take data on every plant in the two acres. And I measured size, thickness, firmness, and you name it, bricks, and it was an incredible amount of time. And I know all that's valuable, but I'm not really writing papers. I'm um, trying to develop varieties, and the uh, professor that I worked under at the uh, University of North Carolina, uh, Randy Gardner, really influenced a lot of the way I do things and have changed. And so my primary focus on my project is flavor and diversity, and I work with these unique um, genes that are found in tomatoes that most people are not using or don't even know about, but they alter the carotenoids and the color in the tomato, they also influence flavor. Now, some of that you can start picking up on if you go in to look at Harry Klee's work and the University of Florida. So in the pathway of developing these carotenoids, these metabolites and uh, are created and they create different flavanols, different um, unique characters to the flavor um, beyond things like bricks and stuff like that. And that's impossible for me to qualify and quantify because I don't have the kind of analysis of it available to me that they do. But you can, you know, make great observations and pick up on things, um, provided you take the right kind of data. So the the smallest one to the left is the sherry gene. And it was recovered, and I'm going to track this one, um, from a very small, almost current-like tomato. But you can see it's kind of ivory and if that one doesn't really show up, but it's got a little bit of a pink tinge to it. The middle one is called uh, apricot, which was found in a variety in uh, Mexico in the 50s. And the other one up is an advanced form of the delta carotene gene, which came from another species. But um, I've had more luck getting size into that one. But um, I want to work with these genes to introduce diversity and take them from small things sitting in seed banks into larger fruit that can either be on their own or somebody younger than me can now take that and run with it and make uh, varieties from it. Um, and that was the idea of doing this is to try to get that diversity out there in a usable form because some of the traits on these are not that great on their own in the plant. They've got a lot of uh, residuals from the wild character. Um, so I also look at adaptation to my environment here in Kansas City. And so I should have switched the things, but early on when we plant, so we, we tried to put out things between April 15th, which is kind of pushing it. Um, and I'm not talking high tunnels directly out in the field, 
to um, May 15th and, and then really get everything in by June. Um, the problem is the climate has shifted in the, um, I've been back here about 20 years and from when I was younger and, and gardened here, it's shifted and we get this early heat which just it can wipe out flowers and if you don't get plants in at the right time it goes from cold to hot real fast um, you'll lose your production and so it's real critical that I find things that not only set flowers but also set fruit so I spend a lot of time early on in the data trying to um, figure out if I'm getting that initial set, but you know, the, the heat kicks in in May now, and it used to wait until like mid June. And you can kind of see that here, but we get these periods now where it's extremely hot and the flowers just disappear. Um, but you can find some survival um, in there, but I use mostly what's called the pedigree method. And I don't know if somebody else is covering this. I didn't have the greatest graphics program here, but it, and I'm gonna also talk about how I use that to track my lines for my data and um, development. So what I've got here is, um, I don't know how, what's covering your screen or not, but up at the top, I've got two parents. So I'm gonna look at that Sherry line. So I took a large red with some disease resistance and crossed it to the Sherry. And what you're looking at is the generations here year by year and how I go about. So I'm gonna show you here how I kind of tracked it. But you make a hybrid and then you look at the F2 and what I've represented here is there's 20 individuals in this for this example. And then in the F3, you'll see here in a second, I've, I've started tracking three different families based out of that. So, so this is kind of showing that over here I took plant number three. And I grew out, let's say five, six of them. And one of them was larger. So I used that the next year. And that's kind of the path that these dark lines are following. But this is a very basic representation of pedigree method of, of just tracking a family and just keeping with it and selecting from it. And some people call this single seed descent. And that's kind of a misnomer sometimes when the soybean project we actually did that but this is more um, you're saving from that one plant any fruit and using that to go on next year as your selection when I start off in the year uh, 2016 this is how I label things and track them rather than names and it, it helps it helps with sorting in the data on the excel spreadsheets and writing things down in the field rather than if I named it and, and kept that name, it's more writing, more, it sounds funny, but it's more space on the tags and more things you have to do. Um, but um, for example, this was the fourth hybrid in 2016. So I named it 16HO4. So I grew that out and I've here selected plant 18. So that is represented as 16HO4 18. So I grow that one out. Next year I select four and it's 16HO4, 18.4. So what this allows me to do is track over time where something originated and what path it's going. So if I lose seed or have a problem with uh, a, a generation, I can go back and, and go back to that family and look at it and keep it going. Um, but that's basically how I set up um, my tracking for a line since I'm doing all pedigree method. This is overly simplified, but it, I was just trying to give you an idea of, of how I go about using those numbers to do it. Um, after the F7 generation, I will switch things and I will go into blocks and uh, that's re represented up here. So I'll plant a block and I'll only pull seed from what's in the center. I'd do something larger than this, but that's also when I start looking, change the way I look at data and um, go into testing for yield and comparing it to other varieties. But I use this block method to ensure um, that my seed stays pure and kind of uh, do it. It's 
difficult for me. I work cooperatively with other farmers for them to understand what I'm doing with this um, because I prefer these blocks to be 100 feet away from any other tomatoes. So I isolate them and there's no white crossing. But um, that gets a little bit testy. So it's, it's kind of nice to um, work with other groups um, like Seed to Kitchen and have some people that are now willing to help me do some of this and also talk um, to the seed companies about, well, you know, I, I don't have the resources necessarily to do this. And, you know, it's part of um, the process of me communicating with them about line development and releases. Um, and I also, in that pedigree method, I showed you uh, a recessive gene, which is pretty easy to track. And uh, the benefit to the pedigree method is that you're going to fix the genes that you want pretty early. Um, it doesn't take as much space and it, it's more cost effective as far as maintaining it and, and not having to put as many plants out in the field, theoretically, um, than let's say a bulk method, which I'm not really going to go into, but the the benefit to a bulk method would work better for adaptation because you would just randomly select from that original F2 population and just keep things going for a while. And then as you get into your later, later generations, then you start selecting for the trait that you want. And the benefit to that is within that population, there's more adaptation and there's a higher amount of genetic diversity where you've kind of bottlenecked it with the pedigree method. Um, so when I'm collecting and using data, um, I break it up into different parts of the season. And it has to do with uh, how much time I have because I'm independent. Um, I can find people to help me do physical work, but usually most of the real, when I need time and help, um, it's really hot and people don't want to be out there. And I don't want to be in the field early in the morning with the tomatoes because they're wet and I'll spread disease. So I either wait until the afternoon or in this picture, I'm in actually evening and you're looking west. And so the, the light from those trees are blocking and the field's tolerable to be in. I mean, I see some shade there on the row, but um, you know, that affects when I take data and, um, and when people are available that I don't usually want to work in the evenings. But in the early uh, season, that's when I take all the information on the flowers. I have plenty of time because it's usually I had help putting things in the field and it's just basic uh, maintenance that I'm doing and I could do by myself, which is mostly stringing and pruning. And that goes pretty quick. So I have time to go look at the individual plants and see what the flowers are doing in that early critical stage when it gets really hot. So I'll go through and I'll count the number of flowers per plant and per cluster. Um, later on, I will count the number of fruit that's set. And I'll note any other issues by hanging a tag. You can kind of see the tag in the background here. Um, and I'll write on it what the variety or what line that was and what I saw. And I'll go back and collect those at the end of the year. But um, it saves me time from sitting down with a notepad and writing notes because it takes quite a bit of time to do that. And I can get more things done if I go through and, and write just the focus in on the flowers. I will also tag things for like if something's variegated. Um, and it's, it's a great way. Um, working with the plants is a great way to further look at the plants more than if uh, somebody else was doing the maintenance and you just came out and went and looked at them, you're, you're paying more attention to the individual plants. Um, in the mid season, um, things are starting to come along and um, it's harder to see those uh, flowers, but um, I'll go through and I'll count the uh, number of fruit. I'll notice any, note anything that's unusual. And like I said, I'll tag the, the plants, but um, it goes pretty quick and I use handwritten notes to do most of this. Um, but when late season comes in, it's really hot and um, it sounds silly, but I've had problems with uh, sweat getting on the pages and um, 
messing up the data. So you have to worry about what pen you use. And I've tried electronics, um, phones, computers, um, even cameras have problems in the field. I have to adjust, you know, when I'm taking those pictures. And um, okay, I'll move it along. But this is an example of how I take that and tag it and write information on. Um, but at this point, I'll switch to videos and I'll do that to um, record taste because that's a better way for me to evaluate what I actually thought in the field than using numbers. Numbers don't really mean much to me. And so I'm in the point now of where I'm looking at my videos and pulling seed for next year. And I'm actually hearing what I thought about that, that I tagged and marked. You know, this is my thought on it. This is what I experienced when I tasted it. It's not just like, oh, a one from five value. It's it's actually what I was thinking, what things. And I, I just don't have the time to write all that. So um, that's how that process has helped me. And I've changed that because I used to take data on size and everything else, bricks. And it's I'm not writing papers, so it doesn't really matter to me that much. And um, it's those observations I make within the videos um, that really help me make decisions about um, what I'm going to put out next year and then what I tagged. But uh, that's basically what I had for you. I hope I didn't go over. I came close, I know. But I'd like to thank the following people. And I missed some logos in here. So, And if you'd like to get a hold of me, think oh there was supposed to be one that's my contact but thank you hi everyone i'm amber carvalho i'm a grad student at aw madison and i've been working with tomato breeding for the last four years so i think i didn't know that there were going to be other tomato people um talking to us so it might be a little bit heavy on the tomato side but i'll try to also um check in more general ways um, so getting in the same page, as I said, most of my experience in, in breeding is tomato, um, which means that I've been working with a self-pollinated plant. Um, it's a very highly labor intensive crop. So we have limited resources, either if you're a private breeder or working at a university or public. Um, you can only get so many plants in your field. Um, and I put here, for example, in grains, you can put thousands of plants to cross and phenotype and select from in a field. Um, and in the same size um, field, you can only put maybe a hundred plants of tomatoes if funding is space allows. So there's strict selection. As Keith said, it's easy to lose genetic diversity because you can create bottlenecks. So it's important to keep seed from earlier generations if you want to um, bring back some diversity into your populations. Um, so I thought I would show you some of our, well, one of our breeding schemes for one of our uh, breeding projects. Um, we have in the top multiple uh, varieties that we use as parental lines and then we developed hybrids or F1s. And then we advanced the lines um, and selected in the field. So, and this is only a portion of the process that we did. So how do we, keep track of everything. Um, that's kind of like what, how I'm gonna focus this part of the presentation. Um, very related to pedigree um, tracking. So um, when we're deciding on crossing blocks, the first thing that we need to think about is what are our objectives? Um, a, a breeder, private breeder might be trying to find interest and interesting traits. Uh, so might want to keep a diversified population always. Um, but um, if we're in the field, if you're a farmer or a gardener or, or a starting breeder, you want to um, have a clear idea of what traits you're gonna be focusing on. Um, and it's usually not single trait, you're gonna be um, working on multiple traits at the same time, which is usually a challenge because there can be some negative correlations, especially with flavor, um, fruit quality, and size and production. Um, 
maybe you want to integrate a disease resistance from variety B, from variety A, for example, into your favorite variety, which is variety B. Um, maybe you just want to maintain a diversified population, or maybe more in the research aspect, you want to do some genetic analysis where you are going to use some specific made in designs like factorial, dialo, trilo, magic populations, etc. And this will really define the classes that you need so you, you can obtain the breeding values, heritability, um, and other genetic um, analysis that you might want to obtain. So before crossing, defining the objectives, of course, is key. And so here, um, I have an example for planting list through the winter of 2019, I think, no, 2020. And so I have the accession names of all of the plants that I'm going to have to cross. And for some of them, for example, I have A6, which is a, a variety, or I say 404, which is an organic seed alliance variety, Japanese black to fell. Those are all stable varieties, so it's not necessary to number them. Um, but others that might be segregating, we want to keep track of each specific plant, which would be the pedigree tracking. So with this list on hand, um, what I do then is uh, make my crossing list. I'm going to have a, a crossing blog that's going to define what do I need to cross with what uh, variety. So this is very helpful to know where I'm going to have to go get the pollen, which plants I have to get emasculated. Maybe I can do uh, both ways, use one as a female and then use it as a male. Sometimes there are some differences. There can be some like maternal effects in what you obtain in the hybrid. Um, so I always try to make both crosses. Um, I mean, the cross in both ways. So it's important to have a clear grid of what you're crossing, and that allows you to keep a good tracking system of the day that you planted, the day that you made the cross, so you can then um, confirm that you have the cross available for harvest in the future, maybe take out some photos. Um, and how do we create a pedigree tracking? So, um, you, you need a good naming system. Uh, Keith showed us that he uses the year and the, the letter that represents if it's a hybrid or a selfing, um, and then the number of that cross. Uh, that's, I would, I would say, a very traditional way to do it, and we use something very similar. Um, and so in the early generations, maybe you don't want to keep up for a plant. Um, numbering or tracking, but maybe per family, which is what uh, also Keith showed earlier. And then in the advanced generations, you want to keep, um, or that's what I like to do at least, keep a more per plant separation. So if you still have segregation, you can make sure to choose and then be able to track that specific um, line with those specific traits that you that you like. So for example, in this figure, we have this hybrid here at the bottom. Um, we have an O4A6, which is an F1 that we crossed with a Japanese black trifle, and that's an F1. And what I'm showing you here is that we have both of the parents. This is ignore the, the first numbers and letters are year and location. Um, so these are the parents. And then I can go back again and look at the parents of this, which is also an F1, and see that it was A6 and OSA 404. So this would be like a triple, a triple cross. It, lasts, it has three different uh, lines in it. Um, and I as I was saying, having a naming convention is very important for you to, able to uh, be able to track uh, what you've been doing. There's the common conventions that you can follow or you can make your own, but you have to make sure to always follow the same rules. Um, we at the Dasson Lab have a reading protocol on how to label everything. So because we have uh, students coming in and then graduating and then other students taking over, it's important that we have a very uh, clear process of what 
uh, everything is, what happened in the past, what was crossed with what, which lines were selected, et cetera, and also have good notes on whatever it is that you're selecting. So for example, very briefly, we have this name that indicates the year 2019. This three letter code is West Madison High Tunnel that was um, in the summer of 2019. Then SGTA corresponds to the hybrid that the original crosses, which were those two. And then F5 would be the generation. And then depending if you have blocks or um, plots with a certain amount of reps, this one was the plot nine, um, A, and then plan two. Uh, but then that it's gonna depend on your, how you plan your system. Um, and this also applies to cell phones, not only, so you make the cross, you wanna keep track of the, tra of the cross, but then you're gonna make cell phones and you wanna make sure to also keep uh, a good record of those. So for example, this is a cross that I made in the winter. We usually make uh, most of our crosses during the winter. And I have here the number of the pot that I use, the name of the female, the male, again, the number, the name of the accession. Then this has been confirmed. And then when we harvest, we have that information that allows us to go back um, in, in previous, to previous generations. Um, and I briefly wanted to show you something that, that we use that it's called brief base uh, that as a Dawson lab we have access to, which has been great to uh, be able to visually track our crosses and our lines. Um, we can put the name of an accession here. And um, as I showed you before, we have it here, for example, it's a four-way cross. We have a hybrid, a hybrid that we are crossing to make another F1. And I can see the parents, which were each one a hybrid. And then if I click on them, I can know where those hybrids came from. Um, and so now he, uh, here I can see that we have uh, four different lines in this cross. So a very diverse, cross uh, that in an F2 is probably going to be segregated a lot. And then we can also see all their related um, crops, or not, not crops, I'm sorry, lines. This is the one that we were looking at. And this is part of um, uh, kind of like a magic population. So we wanted to be able to cross everything with everything. So there are many related lines that use the same parents, but cross them with other of the parental lines. So this is a very good um, program or tool to visualize what we've done. But then the only way to have this is have a very organized tracking system in your computer in an Excel file, for example, where you have the information of um, what you cross, um, when you crossed it, et cetera. And in terms of data collection, I think it also depends on how detailed the data is, depending on how on what generation you are. Um, early generations, I usually what we've done mostly is give scores, maybe productive production score one to five, one to ten. Of course, having like a very well defined. Um, way to assign those scores, those numbers. Um, this allows for faster phenotyping, so you can get more data from most of your individuals or hopefully all of them. Um, something to keep in mind with that way of taking data is most of the scores that are done or are taken um, by observation. So there's going to be an observer bias. You either have to make sure that always the same person or people are walking the field and giving those um, scores or also, or also at the same time, have a chart with photos that can uh, help um, people define where, like which score to give. This also works in with diseases um, and other traits. In advanced generations, I feel like 
traits like yields. It's good to have a detailed record uh, per harvest, per plot, so you can really have a good comparison between lines. For diseases, again, usually we continue with visual scoring, zero to 100% of the plant affected with certain um, pathogen. Uh, a plant pathology lab analysis is expensive, so I, almost impossible to do it for each single plant, but it can be used to confirm that the pathogen is or isn't present. So you, you want to make sure that what you're seeing it's the fungi or bacteria that you are um, working on or selecting for resistance for. Uh, for flavor, um, there can be more detailed tastings in the advanced generations. Um, we usually have a trained uh, tasting group and we rate overall lightness, acidity, sweetness, um, umami, bitterness. If it's other crops, you can uh, also evaluate saltiness, uh, the texture, etc. So we also uh, make sure to have good, uh, more substantial comments from the taster and that we don't have only a number because as, as Keith said, sometimes the numbers are, are hard to understand one person may give a one, another person might give a two, but maybe they experience something similar. So having those comments are very important to us. And also discussing after a tasting gives us a, a better idea of in the moment of what worked and what didn't work. Um, and here in this photo, I'm showing, I'm taking disease data collection because as you can see, there's a lot of Septoria, um, very common here in the upper Midwest. Um, and so I score that uh, on a per plot basis. And there's this app called Fieldbook that allows you to upload all your, um, uh, your plot dimension, not dimensions, but the plot numbers, all your plot information, your field information, and then you can take the data very easily by just, you know, pressing the number that you are assigning to that specific plot. As Keith mentioned also, uh, electronics tend to heat up, uh, but it has worked fairly well for me. I've taken all of my disease data with that and other observational traits. For disease analysis, oh, this is a slide that I used for a previous presentations to just wanted to give you an example of what diseases you could uh, evaluate in the field, for example, early blight and centuria leaf spot are easy to see in the field. And then if you're in the high tunnel, leaf mold and powdery mildew, all of them, I can um, take that data in a single moment while I'm walking the field. So that's very useful. And then I can download, download an Excel file and I don't have to do any transcribing of field notes or stuff like that. In uh, for data analysis, ANOVAS, uh, a variance analysis, is I think the easiest and the most straightforward. Uh, of course, it doesn't apply for every system or every trait. It really depends on the mating design. If we're talking about a, a by B and then comparing F2s, F2 lines, um, that's really quite straightforward. Um, here, for example, this is also a slide that I borrowed from another of my presentations. I was given the results from a trial that we had two management systems, field and high tunnel. We had the varieties. Um, and so this is the model that we built. And then we have the results of the ANOVA, which components were significant to the phenotype that in this case, we took the marketable fruit count, the yields, et cetera. So this is a slide uh, that's showing the yields of the different lines that we evaluated that year in our field. So we had multiple F5s, F6, and so I can easily see you know, what had a higher production and what didn't. And also we had our checks. It's always very important to have your check varieties uh, to know if you're making any progress or not. Um, and here are the photos, but this was just a part of a, a whole other presentation. So mainly the takeout here, the takeaway here is um, with an ANOVA, you can get a lot of information. Uh, you can also do a variety um, trial and compare different varieties. 
advanced lines like we're doing here. Um, and you can do it with most traits. Uh, sometimes you need to tweak, you do need to do some like um, data transformations. If you're working with decimals, for example, in some content of a specific uh, biochemical and it goes from 0 0.1 to 0 0.9, you might want to transform that because otherwise you're not going to see significant differences because the numbers are too small. Um, but that's that's another. And I think I'm over the time. So happy Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's Day. And uh, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer at the end of the um, session. So I, uh, my name is Jared Zeistro. I am with Organic Seed Alliance. I am our assistant director of research and education, and have a background and interest in plant breeding. And I'm happy to share this presentation with all of these other wonderful presenters and with all of you who are watching. My piece is going to be talking a little bit about managing multi-location trials and thinking about them um, and understanding a little bit of what we talk about when we talk about genotype by environment interaction. So let me walk you through both a little bit of the logistics and the theory of multi-location trials. First, a little bit of thinking about why conducting trials in multiple locations. This is something that's worth considering because it's expensive to do so in the sense that this requires um, new sites, it requires potential you know, travel, it requires extra seed, it requires managing um, you know, maybe partnering with other people if the other sites are being managed by someone else. So all of these things are kind of costs that are associated with multi-location, with trials in multiple locations. So what are the benefits? Some of them might be to be able to find consistently well-performing varieties, varieties that across all of the ultimate locations that you might want to see this variety grown in, you find ones that do consistently well. You also be, may be able to identify varieties that are specifically adapted to certain environments. Having more sites is also a real opportunity to see um, less common environmental conditions or ones that you might not see every year in a single site or at all, unless you choose a location that might, where these might show up. So good examples of this might be disease pressure that uh, happens inconsistently, um, but generally will appear somewhere within the larger region of where all your sites are, um, or specific stress like a um, drought stress or an extreme wind storm that might affect your um, you know, lodging. And, and last uh, is just that additional sites provide additional replications, both in the sense of it providing more data for you to incorporate into your overall average, but also as just a, a backup. It's not uncommon for things to go wrong in any kind of agricultural work. And if one of your fields gets completely flooded, it's really nice that you have um, a second location or a third location. And so having that redundancy and having that redundancy be spread out a little bit so that, you know, if you versus just having, you know, replicating that trial side by side, well, if there was, you know, that windstorm, that block of crows, that flood, that still could wipe out your whole trial. Um, but if you split it up, it will reduce the likelihood that you've lost that season. So a little bit of a text heavy slide here, but just some things to consider in setting up multi-environment trials. First off is where are you going to be citing those trials and who are you going to be working with? Are these going to be trials you're going to be managing yourself um, or are you going to have partners managing these trials? Um, do you, Are you and your partners on the same page with kind of the expectations around how this trial is going to be conducted, what kind of information you're collecting, how you're managing it, the amount of work that it might take to manage that. Um, and is the site a site that's, that's useful to you? So in other words, is it a place that is reflective of sort of your ultimate 
environments that you would be wanting your varieties to end up in? Like, is it a, a representative of a production environment if you're trying to have these ultimately end up in commercial production? Is it representative of the right kind of climate and disease pressures and management strategies that you would kind of would like these varieties that you're developing to be adapted to? In other words, is it, if you're developing things for organic, is it being grown in organic conditions? If you're developing something that's um, supposed to be resistant to certain diseases, are you expecting to see those diseases show up and so on? Next tip here is if you're going to be doing this in your trials in multiple locations, thinking about how to make sure that you are at the end of the season feeling like you can look at that data from those different locations as kind of a whole something in whole cloth. In other words, um, are you looking at the same or similar entries in those different locations? They don't necessarily have to be an identical set of entries, but you need to have enough overlap, including um, kind of like Ambar was talking about having some good check varieties in there. So that way, when you're looking at the trial side by side, you can say, well, how did these varieties compare to here versus there? If you don't have the same varieties in both locations, it gets really hard to be able to combine your data. Same thing goes for how did you collect the, the data, making sure that you have the same data collection protocols. Um, if you're measuring, um, if one person's measuring uh, flavor on a one to five rating scale and someone else only does it in bricks, um, how do you combine those that data later? Um, it's not very easy to combine. So making sure that everyone's on the same page with clear data collection protocols if someone else is helping you manage one of those other trial locations. Similarly, having a uh, somewhat similar experimental design uh, will help you be able to combine those that trial information later. So next is how exactly is the data gonna be collected? Uh, are you going to be um, collecting it yourself or is someone else going to be collecting it for you? If you're collecting it yourself um, and the sites are far away, there might be some data that you normally, you know, if kind of you have a, a home trial um, that you can go out and be collecting data on it every day. Um, or, you know, if you're collecting, uh, you know, marketable fruits, you know, you might be out there, let's say something fast growing like summer squash, right? You can be harvesting those, um, you know, a few uh, times a week. Um, but if it's somewhere far away, that gets harder. Um, likewise, something like I work with sweet corn a lot, uh, and it's really sensitive to harvesting. If you're doing taste testing, harvesting at exactly the right maturity date, that can be hard to get that kind of data if it's far away. Um, and so thinking about, okay, if this trial is far away, are there certain pieces of data that aren't going to be really be able to be collected at that remote site? And what are the pieces of data that you can collect at the remote sites? And are those pieces of data going to be useful and additive to your understanding of how these varieties perform? Likewise, if you um, have certain traits that, like going back again to finding good sites, if there are certain traits that you're um, really hoping to be able to see at certain sites, like, oh, this is going to be my drought stress site, or this is going to be my um, uh, you know, early blight site, um, then making sure that you've got a plan for how to collect those site-specific pieces of data and can um, and collect them and incorporate them in there. And then finally, how do you capture environmental data? So at the end of the year, if you see big differences in performance between varieties um, in different locations, the question you might ask yourself is why? And so being able to say, okay, what were the environmental conditions that were different at those sites? So being able to, if you can have a weather station set up or something like that to be able to capture things like day and nighttime temperatures, rainfall, so on, that all can help you later on in untangling and teasing out what exactly happened in your trial across these multiple locations. When we're talking about um, multi-location data, um, unfortunately, I think this slide got a little um, jangled up here, but the, underneath that picture there, it says uh, genotype by environment interactions. And so this 
term that you often will hear when people talk about multi-location trials or talk about um, breeding and selection is basically saying that it's asking the question of how do different genotypes, different varieties or entries perform in different environments? And is there, um, are they performing consistently? So this picture up in the upper uh, left-hand corner, uh, a slot of the slide here that says no G by E, you can see that there in fact are differences between the varieties and differences between how those varieties perform in the environments, but they consistently, in this case, you know, we're saying, oh, one of these was a, a high water and one was a more drought-like conditions. You can see consistently both of the varieties drop about the same amount in terms of in this term in terms of height um, as they move from the well water to poorly watered environment. This is not genotype by environment or interaction. This is an effective environment, but the effect is applied equally to all the varieties, in this case, two varieties. The second thing is you may see that there are differences in how the varieties respond to the environment. In the case of sort of the upper right-hand corner here, um, you can see that variety one um, actually did about the same or even slightly better in the drought conditions, whereas variety two really fell down. But if we were making recommendations or decisions as a plant breeder, the ranking of these varieties didn't change. Variety one was still better than variety two in all conditions. Um, the last, that is the trickiest one to handle, is called crossover or rank change genotype by environment interaction. So this is the case where the environment is affecting the varieties. It's affecting the varieties in such a way that some of the varieties actually respond, um, they change ranks so that variety one is better in, when there's sufficient water, whereas variety two was better in the drought-like conditions there. So understanding what kind of environmental effects you're having is going to be the next question to ask and will inform how you interpret your data. So if you don't have any uh, genotype by environment interaction or is not showing those changes in ranks, then it's a, you can basically have an opportunity potentially to pool your data together, kind of combine across all your environments and make overall recommendations across all your sites. How do you do that? Um, you can just take simple um, means, though um, you need to be aware of the differences in kind of the, the, the magnitude of the ratings in the different environments. So um, here's an example. Um, this is just doing it visually. So this is from our one of our tomato breeding projects. And this is looking at, um, looks like the, the tomato uh, yield across uh, five different environments here. And you can see um, if we took averages, um, looks like I've, the key got cut off, but there were um, the, um, the red there, I think is grown at Purdue University. And if we took simple averages um, that, Purdue's um, uh, high yield across all of the, the varieties, really, if we just took an average, it would be most influenced by those yields at Purdue versus some of the really poor yielding sites. But if we want to kind of look at it more in terms of ranking, a simple way to be able to compare things is just to normalize or standardize those values. So in this case, same data, but what I did was I just um, normalized it to say that each, the average of all of the varieties at each location, we're going to call uh, a zero and the standard deviation around that we're going to set to be one and basically just transform all the numbers to make it so that the average at a given location is zero, the average and the standard deviation is one. And this basically lets us kind of see, okay, we can see here Iron Lady um, was the best basically on average across the locations. And, but you can still see there's variation here. So if we have some uh, genotype by environment interaction, then what do we, um, there's two things we can kind of look at. We can look at um, what we call stability or adaptability analysis. Uh, in other words, we can ask ourselves what varieties uh, are doing especially well at each site and which varieties were pretty stable across all of the sites. This is from a paper by Alex Lyon. Um, this is looking at adaptability analysis, uh, very similar to stability analysis that you might see. And basically what you do here is you arrange your environments 
from kind of what we might call lowest to highest performing. That's just based on the overall mean of the of whatever trait you're looking at. So like going back to that tomato data we looked at earlier, Purdue would have been kind of the highest performing environment. We put that on the far right hand side here and the lowest ones on the left hand side. And then we basically draw a regression line to say, um, as the varieties, um, for given varieties, this is butternut squash, if you uh, move to higher performing varieties, I mean, higher performing environments, environments where the average performance of all the varieties that were grown in that environment was higher, um, as you move to these higher performing environments, how does that variety respond? Um, and if uh, this, this dotted line here, this dashed line represents sort of the overall performance of all the varieties that were grown in all the environments. So as we move across the environments, the lowest performing environments, you have varieties down here. And as it moves up um, in terms of the, the, in the performance of the environment, the varieties also go up. Now, what the straight line here is looking at how well did that individual variety respond? So a flatter line here means it's more stable. It means regardless of a, the, on average, that variety was, or that environment was kind of a poorer environment, or if it was considered a better environment, um, the variety performs pretty stably across all those environments versus, um, let me zoom in to the, just a couple of them here. If we compare these two Metro here, um, it really responds strongly to the environments so that if you go up um, to the highest performing environments, Metro does really well, but it really falls down at the kind of um, lower performing environments. And so this is one that's really adaptable um, to those high performing environments, but not as stable. You can look at this stability. There's a lot of different ways to figure this out. And um, what you will learn is that um, those ways don't always produce the same results. So this is just, there's like four different examples of different ways of measuring this idea of how stable the variety is across the different environments. And you can see that sometimes um, the, you can see a consistent pattern of things that are stable or not, and sometimes not. Um, but another final piece here is that not, not, it's sometimes you can actually look at environments and say, oh, we see a similar ranking of varieties in a group of environments. Like in here, I mean, this is simplified down, but in this case, all of these environments in group one here, variety one perform better than variety two. And if you expanded this out, it might be like similar ranking across many varieties in this group versus here, this group of environments over here um, on the right-hand side, variety two did not perform or perform better than variety one. They flipped. Um, so when we talk about this, we talk about kind of populations of environments or mega environments, groups of environments where you're seeing the same performance. Um, this is a way that's um, a bit cluttered um, with the amount of varieties um, and environments that we're looking at. But this is something called a, a biplot, which is a way to sort of look at both environments and varieties together to see which varieties are doing well in which environments. And basically in this case, the red dots are the varieties and the blue uh, diamonds are the environments. And the closer that the varieties are to each other, the more alike those varieties are performing. And the closer those varieties are to a given environment, the better they perform in that, variety, in that environment. And so you can kind of start to see where certain environments cluster together where certain varieties cluster together in which varieties um, cluster with what environments. So just to wrap up, um, if you're making use of this multi-environment data, questions to ask yourself again are, are you seeing genotype by environment interactions? Which traits? Keep in mind that this is going to be different for different traits that you're looking at. Some you may not see this, these kind of interactions between the environment and genotypes and some traits you might see that. Um, if you're seeing these genotype by environment interactions, does which varieties are performing well across all environments? Which ones are stable? Are there groups of varieties that perform well in certain groups of environments? And then circling all the way back to this question of why, um, are there correlations before, between performance in certain environmental conditions? So if you did have those weather stations out there, did you collect some data that gives you some indication of, oh, all those environments that um, 
where we uh, kind of in that group one of the cluster of environments, we're all wetter environments and all the ones in group two were drier environments, things like that, that you can start to answer when you have multi-location trials. All right, and I'm gonna pass it on to our last speaker. Hi everyone, here's Nico, I'm gonna share my screen. Thanks so much uh, for having me today. I'm gonna go over how to get the most out of Speedlink data. And thanks so much for all the presenters and especially Jared at the end to lay on the ground on a multi-location trial as I'm gonna cover the use of Seedlink. Uh, I'm gonna give a quick intro for the one who don't know then how to build a trial to get the most out of the data with Seedlink and how to create engagement and then go over the results. And then I'm gonna give it a little tutorial on how to use another visualization uh, software, public Tableau, I use a lot. Um, so yeah, quickly, uh, Seedlink is an all-in-one collaborative trialing platform that really allow to create collaborative trial, um, engaging many grower from trial setting all the way to data collection, communication, data sharing, and, and so forth. At a really, uh, at a really minimum cost, it's really to give capacity to people. Like Jerry said, it, it can be very costly to do a multi-location trial. And also Ambar also mentioned on how to give a structure to all collect similar data and make it meaningful insight and how can everyone has biased. And so why collaborative trialing is, is, is really useful in, in this case to give information for multiple people, multiple place. And um, so Seedlinked has multiple feature, multiple trial type, for different statistical design, many feature to really remove all the barrier of collaborative trialing, embedded communication, multi-language. Um, also it's rather in cloud-based and, and, and app and iPhone. So you, you don't need to have your own database and system. You can be all stored in the cloud and seedlinked. Um, and it has its own simple analytics embedded, but also you can export the data and do further analysis. Um, and you add offline mode as well, if you don't have capacity. And, Yes, benefit uh, using the platform is really to you remove, you have all the, I mean, trying to have all the advantage of collaborative trialing uh, and, and trying to remove the barrier of it. And also we can leverage as Silicon has been used by many organization and, and we have a large network of growers that can be tabbed uh, to, uh, if, if you don't have the network yet to, to trial, especially in the US. And so now I just want to, um, lay the ground on, on how to make, uh, to, to get the most data and to get the most, the best decision out of the data using collaborative trialing, collaborative breeding. Um, and first is depending on your entry list and you check what, uh, how, how much farmer do you, do you need to get enough repetition and, and enough reliable data? Um, and, and to calculate quickly this, you really need to know what potential success rate as uh, when you do collective breeding or citizen science, 40, 50% perception rate is very high and it's really good, but you have to take this into, into account. Um, take into account also how many variety each grower is gonna take. In this case, I take let's say three out of eight and then give you kind of a, a target of number of grower to get really, really deep data. Um, and then defining what region do, do you want to, to focus to find the as so, a so grower or to invite grower. Um, here's a quick example of uh, one of statistical model in, in Silink, the triadic, where you can set up a combination. Let's say here I have nine variety and you can decide to, to send three to each uh, grower and Silink do that automatically, create automatically those random combination. But if you increase, we can do three out of nine. You can do four out of nine. Obviously, if the combination increase, you get more repetition, but also grower might give you less data because if you overwhelm with too many varieties, they might not be as engaged. Um, also, it's very important, like the past presenter mentioned, to frame your trait in what you ask along with your breeding goal um, and not ask too much to your grower again uh, to get more engagement, better data, and, and then make a better decision. And so you can pick your trait in seedlink. So it's also default information that are asked, like dates, comments, picture, growing condition, um, as meant past. Presenter mentions those are really important to really put into context the score and seedling do that all in, in the app when you invite your grower. Um, and so 
when you set up all this and you send the seed, it's time to relax a little bit and really let the grower um, grow and send amazing information. Uh, but not also, we have dashboard in Seedlinked um, that allow you to track progress, um, how many planted, how many review, and you can send automatic reminders that you have push notification coming on their phone. Um, and also there's an embedded feed of communication where you can uh, send within each trial, as, almost as a Facebook group, um, you can send information, disease, like, oh, it's time to review X, Y, Z, disease. You can have a picture and it automatically land on their phone. And, and also grower can engage um, on in between to create a community and, and, and ask questions and share, which create engagement. Again, the more engagement you create within your group, the more data, the, more, the better decision you can take. And now I just want to dive um, and using directly seedling tier. Uh, this is a trial manager account. I can see um, here is a trial. I can create new trial. Here is my new trial for this year. You can see I have a lot of grower from 160, 130, 100 invited. For today's uh, webinar, I'm just gonna focus on looking at the data. Um, so I'm gonna um, take a completed trial here again, gonna stay in as a tomato as uh, I guess we all talk about tomato today, but, uh, and so here's a, again, the dashboard you can see of participation. At any given time, you can see live results uh, coming from all your grower and you don't have to wait the end to make decision. It's, it, it's, it's all here. Um, and so here I have all my tomato variety. I had 120 grower with a more than 50% participation rate. And you can see for each grower, you can see the traits or for each variety um, and how many grower per, uh, have sent a review for each variety. You can quickly, uh, um, looking at different traits here, if I want to look at flavor, for example, um, you can see very different response. Look at, for example, those one bred really for a small storage. And, and if like here, here, I can change again, depending on, on your, um, your breeding goal, but you can see uh, drastic uh, change in order, depending on which trait you pick. You can also, as we engage a lot of master gardener, you can, okay, I want only to look at farmer data maybe. Um, and uh, also you can, okay, I want to look at only my RDN zone or all RDN zone. Um, so that's more the scoring part of, of Seedlinked. Uh, but I think, um, oh, and here, big beef plus was a check. Uh, I think what is also fascinating to see here let's say one of the best blushing star is you also have picture from everyone uh, and you can look at pictures sorted by like. Um, you have a visual representation from many sites where you can see when the picture is taken, where, by who. And so you have a visual story uh, by all your grower. Um, and also as mentioned before, you have dozen and dozen of comments um, tagged by traits. So here you have the traits and you have comment and review from, you can see the long list. This is the power also of, of collaborative trialing. Um, and then if you decide, you can also make this data public and, and then all this information can be visible um, in sealing by other um, as well. And I think another piece I want to mention here, um, it's fully collaborative and you can also share here, like maybe you work with uh, other colleague, you work maybe with, um, I'm gonna post here the link here and the, just to give you an idea how we look, um, maybe other breeder or the people and, and they can have a view of the live result trial. You don't, they don't need to, um, you don't need to wait 12 months that are back or it's really live and you can make a quickly decision. Um, now I want to, uh, go over um, exporting data. You can export the data right away here. Um, and then you come in different format for you. Like you see all the different sites, hardiness zones, zip code, and all the review. If you want to run further analysis, you can look also at date, comments, 
And here is a tab with the raw data is. Um, from here, I'm, I'm going to try to quickly show a little bit uh, the use of Tableau using just the raw data here out of uh, Seedlinked to do more further visual analysis. So this is Tableau Public. It's free to download. Uh, it allows you to use multiple files here. I'm just going to take um, the file I just exported. I open it. Um, and here is my different tab. It's, Tableau is really intuitive and you just drag and drop. So uh, I want to use the rating tab here. Um, and here you have different uh, format. Uh, you have the sheet where here is to build your visualization. And then you have dashboard, which is to make it nice. And then story is to build a story of data that you can share. And so let's start um, with a quick visualization. So from stealing data, you can instantly, you have all the uh, local localization. So those were all the site. I just drag the zip code, Tableau recognized automatically. You can put in even the volume of data by site. Um, if you want, you can even um, drag in the filter, all the variety, and you can, um, uh, show a filter here, where then um, you can color code uh, by traits, um, or I guess by um, by rating performance. And so you can put the rating um, into an average, and you can see. Uh, then you can look at different variety. Uh, let's say blushing star, where it was tested, and where it did perform well, or where it did not perform well, uh, very quickly. Um, so that's a really nice way to look at quickly data. You can also uh, look at more variability uh, of the data that can be interesting. You can, here you have different uh, visualization. Um, and so um, you can looking at uh, variability of data by site, which is let's drag and drop the participant number here. And let's put on average data here. So quickly here, you see also variability of data. Certain variety have more spread than other, more stable than other. Um, you can even, if you can remove one data, you can. Uh, so that gives you a really quick, nice visualization of the spread of data if you want to see outlier and, and, and so forth. Um, and I think the last one I use quite a bit is a basic uh, chart where I have my variety. Uh, like this, um, this is going to be the average uh, of the data. I can sort. Um, I, you can color code your variety. You can, uh, okay, we're going to put the data on top here just to see um, the average value. And this quick basic an analytics here, I can put an average with a nine. 95% confidence interval. Um, that's very easy to do. There's clusters, there's many different embedded things you can do. Um, you can also uh, put it as mentioned, uh, Jared, you can transform the data quickly with a quick calculation. For example, I want to look at data in person of total, so deviation from the mean. I like to do that. Um, and then here you can looking, you can add. I have hardiness zone. And so I like to add hardiness zone as a filter. Uh, this way um, you can look at different location and how this data perform. For example, just looking at the smaller uh, hardiness zone and it will automatically compute the result for you. Um, and you can do the same with traits. Um, so you can play with traits here. Uh, and so here you can, now I just, for me, I want um, the best yields, earliness, for example, and disease. Uh, and then you can quickly see uh, the variety. And then from here, you can uh, create a, quickly a nice story of the data that you can share with colleague and with other. Or, um, and so I create a, a, a dashboard where I'm going to create a story. So let's say we want to show the map uh, of the data and performance. That's going to be one. Nice slide. Another one is going to be let's the variability of the data. I made auto fit here, and the last one is going to be the overall performance to play uh, here. 
And so those are kind of my nice three uh, dashboard. And then I can create a story where I can again draft this is going to be my map um, and my variability uh, and my overall performance. Um, and I like to make everything look nice. Um, and then you have an account. I'm um, just you can really quickly uh, save into the cloud. Uh, this is, let's say, test just to give you a flavor of how we're going to look. Um, and then I'm going to share this in the chat um, for you to see. Um, and yeah, that's kind of what I wanted to share. I know we are behind in time, so I'm going to stop here, but I'm just going to put this uh, link in the chat here quickly for you to see as an example. Um, and with Tableau, you can put in full screen and really play with the data. Um, and everyone can receive this, can play with the data. So it's very useful. Um, so yeah, that's wrapping up how to get the most out of seedling to make better decision. Um, sorry, we are over the time, but uh, just a couple of the tool uh, in your toolbox to run collaborative trialing and make your breeding or trialing program more efficient. Hey, thank you so much, Nico. Thank you, Ambar and Keith and Jared, uh, everybody for your presentations. That was really cool. Uh, Nico, that software is really powerful and it was really cool to see you playing with it real time and how fast everything is. Um, we've got a, we've had a few questions that have come in that have been you know answered directly to there, but a couple of questions uh, in the chat for Nico. What are the qualifications to be a seedling grower? What do you need to do to, uh, to participate in those trials as a grower? Yeah, so um, that's a good question. As you run your trialing, you can, you can bring your own growers that you trust if you want to. Um, you can also open it to everyone who wants to be part of your trialing program. Uh, and even if they have less experience, uh, that's you decide. We, within Seedlinks, um, we kind of flag every grower who participate in trial from beginner to ex expert. And uh, so we know all the growers that typically are returning data and highly engaged and give you uh, good information. Uh, but um, I really encourage uh, you all to give more trust to all the gardener and, and grower around you. Oftentimes, they have way more expertise than you think in the data that they send, especially when it's easy, framed, is incredibly powerful. Um, uh, clarifying question from the uh, same person who asked that is like, is the weight of a response from a grower the same if they're just growing one plant on their balcony or if they're growing a full high tunnel? Like how do you, how do you differentiate the um, amount of plants or the, the level of participation between different growers? Yeah, that, those are really good questions. Uh, the power, power of collaborative uh, trialing is that you're not working with three grower, you're working with 10, 15, 20, 100 grower and, and via platform you make it easier. And what you do is that by having more, you have definitely more variability, but then you have a lot of strength in, 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 in the trends. And so we, right now we don't give any weight um, in, in the, each one, however, we are work, we dissociate farmer and gardener, um, and we are moving towards also tagging which more are more expert versus other, and in the future to try to model and bring more into seedling uh, weight system. And those are a really good point. Uh, thank you for sharing. Okay, and one last question for you, Nico. Are you the breeder of Dark Star F1 tomato? No, no, uh, Pan American has. Dark Star and uh, I think Pan American work with breeders, they have their own breeder as well, but I think it's from Pan American. Question for anyone here that wants to respond. Um, they, they're talking about with, with corn or with some outcrossing species, there may be a big improvement when using F1 uh, or hybrid plants. And they're wondering if tomatoes, for example, mostly self-pollinating crop, if they have the same uh, hybrid potential 
um, as 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 corn? Uh, I'll pop in. Um, depends on the trait you're looking at, but, but um, yes, there is uh, hybrid vigor in various traits for tomatoes. It's very well documented. It just kind of depends on what you're looking at. I can also pop in a bit. Um, one thing that you can do sometimes more easily with hybrids is combine traits from different, you know, different parents if you only need heterozygosity to have an effective trait. So some disease resistances may be effective in the heterozygous state. And that might allow you to combine disease resistance with flavor faster. You can also then, you know, breed something that's homozygous for disease resistance and flavor, but that hybrid combination may be a faster way to get at some combinations. Thank you, Julie. I, I, okay, go ahead, Pete. I was gonna add, um, my sound cut out for part of that, so I'm not sure, but, um, Sometimes when you're combining uh, homozygous disease resistance in tomatoes, there's some bad linkage that come with it that affect fruit quality. And so sometimes it's better to have that disease resistance in a heterozygous state than it is in the homozygous state. But that's not always the case. That's just an example. And that happens with uh, Fusarium wilt resistance three. And I think to I think they broke the language, but uh, tom tomato spotted wilt um, produced uh, little bumps on the bottom of the fruit, which wasn't marketable. And so they had to break that linkage, which I understand they have now. But um, that was kind of why that was always put into hybrids. Do you know if pH genes for late blight have bad influence for fruit? That is one of them that, um, and I can't remember which one offhand. Um, that did, if it's in the homozygous state, it did affect fruit, but I can't specifically recall what it was. I, I think it was um, uh, blossom scar as part of it, but there's something else I don't, I remember I, we don't have late blight here, so I don't really look at it. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Keith. I also wanted to point out the resources that you see here on the screen, a lot of good uh, materials from OSA as well as from uh, some other organizations that have put out some more advanced resources for data analysis. And so you're welcome to check those out. There's also a step-by-step -step guide for growers is a book that I have learned a lot from and I really like. There's a lot of really clear examples if you want to go into more of the breeding methods that were mentioned in today, like pedigree, bulking, uh, mass selection, other ones. It's I found that to be a really uh, digestible and easy to understand resource. So I definitely recommend that um, to to farmers or practitioners. Uh, if you have any other questions, feel free to keep putting them in the Q and A or in the chat. Um, we just have a few minutes left here. Uh, I have a yeah. Go ahead, Keith. I have a comment about um, environment tracking the environment. I learned this from a grower. I didn't know you can do this. Um, you use your GPS coordinates on your cell phone, and you go to the NOAA National Weather Service site, and you put that in instead of like a zip code or a town name, and um, that will pop up an estimate between the stations. Um, for that little specific area. So you can track fairly well what's going on if you're not there. And um, I can't remember if they put that in a historical, do you know, Jared, if they can, if you can look at that historical build that or, or not. Um, but it, it was just, I was really surprised. I didn't know you could do that. Yeah, I've had a hard time getting the historical data um, using that method, but the real time data, definitely. That there may be a way to get it, get the historical data. Maybe someone else knows. Nico, I don't know if that's something that uh, is one of the capabilities that could be built into Seedlink, or if that if, if environmental yeah. data is available. Yeah, that's on the queue for a while, and you know we put it to hard in a zone, um, and then we really is uh, hoping to find funding to work with uh, Prism or Oregon State. Uh, where all the climatic lab uh, funnel uh, to integrate um, all those information. So 
it will come for sure. Uh, it's just a matter of time. But uh, yeah, I'm really excited to yeah add more data science and information behind seedlings um, when we have the capacity. So I know you can do that. You can build that with uh, the weather underground if you have your own station and create your own station. Um, relying on somebody else's is hit or miss because it goes in and out. And if you're out in a field, you're going to have to have internet connectivity and all that going on. You know, so it's better if you have a, a good internet connection. You can build that easily with the weather underground. But, um, you know, I wouldn't be valuable to me because everywhere I go, I, I don't get great cell service. Yeah. For seedling, like you have package, our package with connected to world claim. And so, we are actually right now doing some analysis with um, a group, Dr. Van Etten, who is leading collaborative trialing and is analyzing all the data of, of seedling to see uh, what can be do for GBAE. And so, yeah, I hope to be able to share more soon. Great. Well, I'm not seeing any more any more questions that have uh, not been answered so far. So I think we'll we'll wrap it up. I wanted to thank everybody again for for watching and for all your great questions. Uh, this is not the end of our project. Our project is continuing through this year. We're going to be uh, compiling all of these webinars along with all of the resources that we've been posting and even more resources, short instructional videos and a few supplements that will all be posted into uh, what we're calling the Collaborative Plant Breeding Toolkit. Uh, that's going to be uh, posted on eOrganic and we also invite you to join us in the Organic Seed Commons, uh, which is a network of uh, hundreds or I think we're in the thousands of, of seed practitioners, everybody who's interested in seed growing, seed policy, um, seed commercialization, plant breeding. Um, it's a great network of people that you can interact with, ask questions, share updates. Um, if any of the other team members here have any final, final thoughts, I'd welcome that. Yeah, thanks everyone for joining us and participating and we welcome continued interaction afterwards. So don't hesitate to reach out. Yeah, thanks everyone for joining. Yeah, and, and get on there and join a, a variety trial on Seedlink if you haven't already, or the Seed to Kitchen Collaborative is, is hosting some more variety trials this year. So uh, get, let's get involved. Let's keep working together. <laughs>